If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, Robert Harriman here. How are you doing today? I appreciate you listening. And I encourage you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Now here in the state of Florida, dozens of confirmed cases of the bacterial infection caused by Vibrio vulnificus occur annually, along with dozens more in other Gulf states. My guest today says infections from Vibrio vulnificus are a summer staple and are increasing along with global warming. Joining me now to discuss Vibrio vulnificus is Judy Stone, MD. Dr. Stone is an infectious disease specialist, a Forbes contributor, and the author of a recent Forbes article, Flesh-Eating Vibrio Can Come from Cleaning Fish as Well as Swimming. Dr. Stone, welcome to the show, ma'am. Well, thank you for having me back again, Robert. Okay, well, let's start out with some basics concerning Vibrio vulnificus and give the listeners a foundation. Uh, like you say in the article, Vibriosis is a summer staple. So where is Vibrio found in the U.S.? And what kind of environment and what time of the year is it most present? Sure. Vib- Vibrio are a group of bacteria that are found in warm coastal waters or tidal, tidal estuaries. There are many species, and some are relatively mild and cause uh, food poisoning, and others, particularly vulnificus that we've been hearing about, uh, cause s- serious uh, skin infections, bloodstream infections, and even death. The other Vibrio that you hear or about uh, overseas more often than here is uh, Vibrio cholera, which kills hundreds of thousands of uh, people globally each year. Now, how common is vibriosis caused by Vibrio vulnificus in the U.S.? Uh, in Vibrio vulnificus causes 100 to 200 cases per year. Uh, although other Vibrio, it goes up to 80,000. So it's it's very in common in the U.S., but mostly along the coast again, as we, we talked about. Yeah, and the, okay. and, and, yeah. And, the, and the species that we see most frequently in the U.S. is Vibrio parahemolyticus. Right, and that's the one that causes uh, food poisoning from eating shellfish. And that, well, we see the uh, wound infections more often uh, along the Gulf Coast, the parahemolyticus and, and the uh, food poisoning, as it were, is seen anywhere that there's a tidal area uh, ranging up to New Hampshire, and there were even some cases in Alaska a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, most uh, infections are contracted by eating raw shellfish or entering the body uh, through an open wound. Uh, can you elaborate on this? Sure. Uh, in terms of the, the uh, food... Raw oysters are the most common cause of infection, and they usually cause a milder illness with watery diarrhea, vomiting, and cramping. And you get that within about 24 hours after eating your food, and that lasts about three days. But even with the food poisoning, about 15% of people uh, require hospitalization, and 1% die. Olnificus is the one that's uh, scarier because... um, it, it's uh, overall more more virulent, although you've enlightened me that some people uh, have mild infections with that too. Yeah, yeah that's what, uh, the state of Florida does say that uh, infection in healthy people is um, typically milder. And uh, I'm actually going to get into that right now. Um, Though uh, infection in healthy people is typically mild, at least according to the state of Florida, um, 
people who have weakened immune systems, particularly those with chronic liver disease, this is an incredibly serious uh, and some mostly life-threatening infection. Uh, can you discuss the pathology of Vibrio vulnificus? Sure. There are a couple of things that make this more, more virulent. One of the things is that some, some of these strains have a capsule on the outer part of the bacteria that keeps it from being eaten and killed by our white blood cells. Now, part of why people with liver disease uh, are more susceptible is because they already have uh, uh, less active or less effective white, white blood cells. And the bacteria also produce toxins that cause the cells to die. So um, the other interesting thing about Vibrio is that iron uh, metabolism is sometimes impaired in people with liver disease, and increasing iron levels in a person's body fuels the Vibrio growth. So one of the things that's striking is that people with liver disease are 80 more times likely to develop the infection and 200 times more likely to die. And that's why you see warnings posted in seafood restaurants now to be careful eating raw, raw uh, shellfish or the like if you have liver disease. Right. Um, uh, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Now, for many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Gl Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or e email them at info at glymedx.com. Um, Dr. Stone, can you go ahead and talk about the diagnosis and the treatment for Vibrio? Yes, and, and this comes back to your information from the Florida Department of Health. I'm curious uh, how they come up with uh, saying that Vibrio is mild because diagnosis is very hard uh, in most cases unless you get clues uh, from a careful history or people who are very sick. There's a characteristic rash that causes um, bullae that that are bloody, so they're called hemorrhagic bullae. And once you see that, you'll never forget it. Um, and so that's very typical in diagnosing it in people with bad skin infections or sepsis. In terms of uh, the GI vibrio, the diagnosis is going to be missed unless uh, the lab is specifically told to look for Vibrio, and most docs don't know that they need to order that specifically. So it requires special culture media, and it's going to, um, that makes uh, the diagnosis more, more difficult. And what about treatment? Uh, treatment antibiotics are very effective, uh, usually a, a tetracycline is given along with a third ge generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone. Some people will use a quinolone, but most people use the, the uh, double antibiotic. And you also need uh, to debride or remove the dead tissue from wounds uh, to cut down on, on the infection. And I was, um, it's such a serious infection that 10% of patients end up with an amputation of the affected area. Yeah, so th th this organism is one of the, the several organisms that are classified under the flesh-eating bacteria, essentially. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, we talked that um, eating raw shellfish and entering the body uh, via an open wound, typically when you're out in the, in the, in the water, are the likely uh, ways to contract it. However, some cases are not quite usual. And there was a recent case in Seattle that was rather unique. What happened in this case? I, I loved reading about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> brightens my day. Uh, in, in this case, a man bought a fish from a live fish tank at a supermarket in Seattle, and he cut himself or nicked himself while he was pre preparing the fish, and he became septic. Now, the the other thing that was interesting is that and unusual is that his wife uh, also became ill, although her, uh, she she got that from eating the cooked fish. And one of the things that this, since you usually don't become ill from cooked food, 
uh, this serves as a good reminder, too, that steamed foods, especially like crabs, don't always get hot enough to kill Vibrio. And I learned that the hard way when my husband became very ill uh, when we were vacationing on the Outer Banks after eating crabs. And the docs we consulted said that probably, that although they were steamed and cooked, they simply hadn't be- become hot enough. So that's a warning for, for your listeners, too. Now, there was even a, a more recent, uh, another recent story where it ended, it ended tragically, but uh, an individual uh, with a fresh tattoo uh, contracted this bug. Yeah, that was horrible. Uh, any open wounds are, are a risk for Vibrio. So if you have uh, any cuts or uh, a, t- a fresh tattoo, you shouldn't go in seawater. In this case, a 31-year-old man died from this. Now, he also was immunosuppressed, but I would emphasize that you don't have to be immunosuppressed to die from Vibrio uh, uh, wound infections. Um about a third of people with vulnificus uh, infections had an open wound. This is also, uh, you can see serious infections from uh, freshwater uh, infections too, though, though not, uh, not usually with Vibrio, but that, that's a warning. Anybody who has an open cut should be really careful and clean their, clean their wounds. If they get them wet, clean them promptly. Yeah. Now, Vibrio is not alone when it comes to seawater bacterial infections. What other dangers are out there? There are a couple of other odd, uh, odd infections. Uh, the most common one is a mycobacterium, which is related to tuberculosis, though not person-to-person transmitted. And mycobacteria, mycobacterium marinum is uh, causes skin infections again after an injury uh, in water. It's difficult to culture and diagnose. It takes months of specific antibiotics to cure. There have been some cases in uh, fishermen and even in the Chesapeake uh, Bay, as far north as that. And I had a patient early in my practice who who had that from her uh, fish tank. And had she not given me the clue about uh, uh, about having had a splinter in her hand before she cleaned the fish tank, you know, that there would have been a marked delay in diagnosis. And this, too, needs special uh, culture media. So an impor- uh, history is critical in diagnosing that. The other uh, infections are a bacteria called strep NA, which uh, causes skin and soft tissue infections. Uh, in some people, uh, uh, there have been cases from cleaning fish, especially tilapia, for some reason. Yeah, I can recall, speaking of the Chesapeake Bay, when I was living in Maryland many years ago, uh, I was working in a hospital, and they called me to the ER, and uh, they wanted me to take a look at this. And this person had this horrible cellulitis on their leg. And I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, he was out fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, and when he was bringing the, the line back, the hook went into his leg. So uh, two days later, the culture grew Aramonis hydrophila. Right. Yeah. So it was yeah. Like- that's a really vicious uh, bug, too, and I saw a patient almost die from that, from uh, uh, an injury in a lake in, uh, near Rochester. Yeah. So there's a lot of other things out there, that's for sure. Now, now many people are linking climate change and warming temperatures with increases in mosquito-borne and tick-borne infections. Um, in your piece, you offer cases which authors link... Uh, Warming seawater temperatures uh, also to different infections like Vibrio vulnificus. Can you talk about this? Yeah, there, there were a couple of clues to this. One is that there has been an increase in cases uh, since, I guess, about 1995 in particular. There's been a steady uh, increase in cases that correlates with rising seawater temperatures. Uh, there have also been outbreaks in Israel and around the Baltic uh, Sea that were associated with such rises. And the other uh, oddball thing that I learned this week was the, the report of um, Saharan dust storms that are related to climate change and increasing increasing the Vibrio in Texas by, by bringing um, added iron and nitrogen that gets dumped into the Gulf of uh, uh, the Gulf waters there 
and causes uh, Vibrio to, to multiply. Yeah, yeah I, I found that very interesting. That's the first time I heard of that. Um, now, you conclude in the article that, quote, we're not doing enough to combat climate change and we'll see an increase in infections associated with the warming. Um, so, Dr. Stone, what exactly can we, what should we be doing to really make a difference? Well, the biggest things uh, that we should be doing are are on a governmental level, uh, and I'm concerned that we're going to uh, get to a, a critical point of no return on this. But there are things that we can be doing as individuals to uh, to help reduce green ca- greenhouse gases, like reducing carbon fuels, using less energy, uh, uh, changing to efficient appliances, and, and uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, we switched to using a, a hybrid vehicle, uh, and we personally are also uh, switching to solar power as the prices for that come down. Reducing waste is easy, composting, uh, and reducing uh, water are all things that uh, people can do that would reduce the our uh, carbon footprint and and help in small ways to minimize greenhouse gases and uh, global warming. warming. But uh, again, much of this needs to be done with government initiatives uh, because it's such a grand scale. Okay. And finally, what advice do you have for the public concerning preventive measures uh, for Vibrio vulnificus infections? Well, uh, I... I, of course, uh, am not a fan of eating raw oysters or shellfish, uh, <laughs> although there are infectious disease people who, who do enjoy, enjoy doing that. Uh, but that, that would be one thing. Some places, um, so making sure your food is cooked, um, mostly if you, if you indulge in raw oysters, being aware that that's a risk and uh, relaying that information should you become ill. In terms of wounds, which are uh, more commonly how people are going to get septic, either stay out of the water with, with you have, if you have wounds that aren't healed uh, or clean them thoroughly with a, a, an antiseptic like uh, betadine, which is povidone iodine, mm-hmm. uh, as soon as you get out of the water. And again, if you become ill, uh, tell your physician about unusual uh, exposures. So, but again, a third of the people with who got serious vulnificus infections went swimming in seawater with an open wound. So they're risking their life doing that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Judy Stone, for your time and expertise, and uh, congratulations on a very good article. Thank you, and thank you for having me back again, Robert. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Bye-bye.